Welcome to the Wenatchee Valley Museum and Cultural Center's Social Justice Community Forum Series. I'm Ashley Center, the Outreach and Public Relations Coordinator. Today, we are discussing lack of diversity in nature and outdoor recreation. While North Central Washington is an outdoor recreation hub with climbing, mountain biking, hiking, backpacking, whitewater activities, gardening, and so much more, not everyone in our community is represented in these activities. Today, we have Spanish translation provided by Joe Cortez with Claire's Languages. If you are logged into Zoom, you have the option of listening to the translated audio channel. You can do this by clicking on the icon of the world and selecting the Spanish option. Before we begin, I want to remind the panelists to speak a little bit slower than your normal rate to help out our translator. If you are joining us live and have questions for the panel, please submit them through the Zoom Q&As or chats located at the bottom of the screen. If you are on a mobile device, these are available at the top of your screen. If you're on Facebook Live, please submit your questions in the comments our staff will do our best to address as many of these questions as we're able to. Thank you to the Wenatchee River Institute for partnering with us on this forum. Joining me as co-host today, we have their community program manager, Rachel Bishop. Hey, Hi, Rachel. The Wenatchee River Institute is an environmental learning center in Leavenworth. Our mission is to connect people, communities, and the natural world and we can only do that when our outdoor spaces, hiking trails, parks, and careers in science and conservation are safe and welcoming for all people. Racism is just as real on our public lands as it is in our cities. We cannot instill a sense of connection to the environment when any discrimination occurs in our outdoor spaces. As a white majority organization, we commit to fight systemic racism in our spheres of work and influence, education and environmentalism. Before we get started, I would like to introduce our panelists today and the things they enjoy doing the most outdoors. We have Chelsea Murphy of She Colors Nature and Chelsea enjoys hiking, camping, snowboarding and all things that get her out and connected to nature. We have Karen Francis McWhite a mom, gardener, baker, and writer, and she enjoys hiking, camping, and, and Nordic skiing. Elisa Lopez, the project director at Team Naturaleza, and, and she enjoys hiking, snowshoeing, and nature journaling. Paige Castro Reyes, director of programs, Community Campus Partnerships for Health, and she enjoys hiking, climbing, fishing, and paddling. Julie Edwards, Colville tribal member, hunting, fishing, and gathering roots and berries. Nathan Isaac, the founder of Stallion, and he enjoys exploring national parks, camping, and mountain biking, and hiking. And John Cyrus, also known as Cy I, committee coordinator of Upper Columbia United Tribes, and he enjoys fishing, picking berries and hiking. So thank you all for being a part of this discussion today. Our first question to all panelists is what sparked your passion for spending time outdoors? I can go ahead and get started with that. Um, well, it was a lot of Discovery Channel and Animal Planet growing up. Um, so that, that sparked an interest in the outdoors for me. And then in college, I decided I didn't want to be a veterinarian. And I studied abroad in Panama and did it for me. I knew I wanted to be a veterinarian. I think I was the same uh, for me as a child. It was um, my mother and I, we lived in Southeastern Arizona and I used to get up every Sunday to watch the underworld, uh, see the underwater world of Jacques Cousteau. 
And I was convinced. We just had, this is old school. I feel like I'm dating myself, but there were the three color tube TVs, you know, um, this gigantic box. And I was convinced I was going to grow up to become a marine biologist because I wanted to do that. I had never seen the beach. I'd never been to anything tropical, but uh, that brought me someplace I didn't know existed. I think for me, um, it started as a child as well. You know, the seeds were planted when I was a Girl Scout, a little brownie, um, a long, long time ago. But um, just more recently, I would say, is when I started getting into the outdoors more consistently. And um, I think that with that seed that was planted so long ago, it was really easy for me to kind of always be somebody that got outside. You know, it didn't look like hiking or camping or anything too consistently, but I was always just intrigued by gardening and um, just being in natural green spaces, growing up in Tacoma, um, going to parks and walking and just being out in nature. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Hi everybody. For me, I don't think there was a, a separation between the outdoors and life in general because my people were gatherers and hunters so from the time I was a baby I was in the mountains we lived by the seasons so there was in the spring it was roots then went into berries and then it went into the canning and preserving of the foods and then it went into hunting season fishing season ice fishing season so it's more of a lifestyle than it was a choice. Thank you. Um, I think for me, uh, kind of a, a, a mix of what I'm hearing. Um, my family is originally from Guam and moved from Guam to the Wenatchee Valley um, in the 70s. And some of my first memories of being outside are fishing and uh, catching fish and bringing it to grandma to fry. Um, but then also just as I was growing up, I always found myself kind of wandering, um, even when we lived in the city, kind of on those edge spaces of finding Himalayan blackberries or um, foraging now with uh, friends. Um, but yeah, fishing with my dad, um, whether here or in the ocean is kind of my first memories. Um, for me, I, I think one of the things that just really brings to mind is just being young and have an opportunity to get outside. My parents, they love to um, get us out into nature and let us just burn some energy, run around. But I think it's just like the color palette, um, the sense of just wild animals, uh, birds, uh, just the different elements. It just kind of like created this adrenaline that is just so just, it's its own thing. And just growing up, that's just something that has been a place where, you know, it's just been instilled to just, to get out in nature and just, and just be free, you know. John, you just joined us, but I'd like to give you the opportunity to answer the same question everybody else has. Um, our first question was, what sparked your passion for spending time outdoors? Okay. Um, greetings, everybody. I'm Chad Squisai Ai. I'm Chuck and Sukuna Kailsnaf and Pasquals. Um, I'm a Wenatchee um, travel um, person, citizen. My, my grandmother was born outside of Monitor at a fish camp um, around the turn of the century. Um, and that's basically, you know, from, from my grandmother and, and all of our family, just we were always outside. Um, with my grandmother, we were, we were collecting cedar roots, we were picking berries, digging roots, hunting with, with my cousins and my uncles, being out in the woods, growing up on the reservation here in Omak, Washington. Um, 
we were always outdoors uh, and always doing something. So um, it's just kind of a, a way of life and, and something that, that um, really just drives everything that I do nowadays um, in, in my current work as a committee coordinator, but um, just trying to get people and, you know, sh sharing that with my daughters and, um, you know, I just, I love the outdoors. Love it. Thank you. Um, we are curious if anyone would like to share um, anything about obstacles they have faced locally when recreating outdoors or connecting with the natural world. And you can think of locally as the Wenatchee Valley, specifically the town you live in or the Pacific Northwest. If I could just add, so like we've done a lot of gathering in the Wenatchee National Forest around the icicle. I mean, that's where my people are from. So we're always going out and, and doing those things. And um, in the past, we always had relationships with the, with the U.S. Forest Service folks or DNR folks. So they knew, they knew us when we we're out, you know, like, oh, where are you going? You know, we're picking huckleberries. All right, you know, take, take care. But when they have the turnover and they don't know who we are, like we can run into problems and they'll say, well, sorry, you can't go up here. And I, well, actually it's our traditional territory and we're just going back there. And, and so it takes some re-education. You know, it's always important to, to know your, your park ranger and, and uh, keep them informed. So yeah, there, there can be barriers. Um, that's one, that's just the human barrier, but there are natural barriers. So I think um, for me, as far as um, just experiencing uh, moving from the city and then coming to Leavenworth, uh, I've been here probably about eight years now. And uh, one, one of my biggest obstacles, I think, was kind of just tapping into community. Um, and feeling included, you know, as a black mother, I think when you come into a space like Leavenworth that is majority white, um, it's, there's growing pains, you know, I think just getting outdoors, I didn't really know what that looked like. Like it was for me, um, for me, it was, you know, just being outdoors meant nature walking and just like being present in green spaces. And I think for a lot of moms, you know, it's, mountain biking or rock climbing or we're doing something really extreme and that was hard for me that was an obstacle mentally and physically like I didn't know I didn't have any of that gear or where to start and um, not that I'm doing anything radical right now but I just feel like as a black mom tapping into a community of white moms was an obstacle it was it was and still continues to be something that I, I struggle with a little bit I think Chelsea, the point you made about like having the right kind of gear and what what is deemed you know uh, good gear, outdoorsy gear. When um, I just remember uh, like when I was younger, just going hiking barefoot or doing things, you know, rock hopping or you know things that um, just that there, there, there were no kind of, you know, with, with more extreme sports, you know, there's definitely um, technical safety gear, but even just the knowledge around how to use that gear kind of felt safeguarded at times. Um, Chelsea, like you, I'm not much into the kind of the, ex the extreme sports. <laughs> I like to be out and about. I like to just sort of, uh, one of my favorite things actually is to run the track um, at uh, the local schools. And uh, when the shutdown happened, uh, you know, God bless the, the principals, because I, I reached out to them. I was like, are the, are the tracks closed? Because where we live, uh, we don't really have sidewalks and it's a fairly busy road, especially with construction 
um, on the bridge here in Kashmir, and people will just speed down our road. So I don't want to um, try to walk or run right where we live. And, uh, you know, I had a few folks who say, oh, just use it anyways. Yeah, the track is closed, but just use it anyways. And I was like, no, I don't, I don't feel safe making that choice because I'm already highly visible and this just doesn't feel like the best time for me to be highly visible and breaking rules uh, when I've, you know, I've visited friends, um, uh, one in particular from the Okanagan County, for example, which I love, it's beautiful. I, I love this entire region. Uh, and the neighbor didn't see him, but saw me first and decided it was his job to come over to my friend's property with a sidearm to make sure that it was okay for me to be there. And uh, it was a bit distressing and thankfully, you know, my friend came back and next thing I know, I get an invitation to the guy's house to see his <coughs> insane gun collection, which, you know, I mean, hospitality, sure, but uh, I have some trust issues there. <laughs> um, and so the, the barriers are a little more there, there are certain barriers that my white friends simply don't have because they don't have to think about um, will their presence be viewed as transgressive in that particular space. And, and I do. So, yeah. Rachel, your question was on barriers to the outdoors for us personally. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, for me, I think all of the ones that Team Atrolas is kind of like addressing, which are transportation, the cost, the lack of knowledge, all of those were truly barriers for me growing up. And I think a little bit still now, um, obviously, you know, uh, Hispanic Latino families tend to be lower on the economic scale. Um, so I still find myself very limited to where I can go and where my little Honda can take me up to. I'm very limited to only paved trails and not, um, like I really want to take some of my friends up to Kolchak, but none of our cars can make it up. Um, so that's, you know, we're limited there. Um, I was always very curious to know what the little triangle on the signs were all over Leavenworth. And then I think, I think when I came back from college, I finally found out that they were meant for campgrounds. <laughs> Um, so just little things like that, lack of child knowledge, definitely was a barrier for me. Um, in high school, I really wanted to get out, get out and hike, but none of my friends hiked. I didn't have any family who hiked, so I couldn't really ask anyone to go with. And it just seemed like a crazy idea for my family because they work outdoors Monday through Saturday. So the last thing they want to do is go outside on a Sunday or a Saturday evening when they've been outside all day. Well, our um, next question is, uh, why does the topic of diversifying the outdoors matter? So I can just add, answer this question um, only based off of my life experiences, right? Why, why is that? diversity in the outdoors important to me. Um, I think for me growing up in a black family in the city, um, having barriers and obstacles, you know, I could name so many, you know, there were five of us growing up in my house. Um, there were five of us growing up, siblings and then uh, my parents and um, my mom grew up in the military. She actually grew up doing a lot of camping and fishing and hunting and other things with her dad. And um, I think for me, there were, was such a gap between, you know, my mom doing those things and then her translating those things to me um, and my brothers and sisters, you know, with Mount Rainier being so close, but like yet so far away. Um, 
we didn't do a lot of the things that I get to do with my, my kiddos. And I think for me as a mom, it's a really fun thing to, to get to choose that. You know, as a mother, I get to choose what my kids get into. I get to choose the spaces that they feel confident and cool and collected in. And for me, one of those spaces that I never had as a kid was hiking or camping. Like that wasn't something we did often. And so I didn't really feel comfortable doing that. Um, but my husband, on the other hand, grew up in Leavenworth and has shared a lot of things with us. And so for me, I just want to make, make those spaces comfortable for them. Um, so representation and diversity in the outdoors is, is personal for me, right? I want to see the outdoors be, be better and be greater for not only me, but my kids and, and their kids. And just, I think the future of the Valley really is, is in our hands. Like these panelists here and the, the people of color that are really taking a stance and saying, you know, the outdoors is for all and the, the benefits and and the space is should be for all. We should all feel comfortable getting outdoors. And so for me, I think the fire in me and my passion right now definitely is fueled from motherhood and, and having two girls that I really just want to be confident in spaces that I didn't grow up being confident in. This is this is one of them here. Let me see how I know. <laughs> If I could jump in, I, I am, I'm really inspired and, and um, excited to see all the faces on the panel. It really makes my heart happy that you're getting out in, into those areas and hiking and stuff. Um, the, the, in Piscuaus people, um, when you look up and down the Columbia River, whether it's Entiat, Chelan, Wenatchee, Methow, those are all named after the tribes that live in those, those areas, right? And especially for the Wenatchee people in Pasquaus, um, it is a place where the, the water comes out, the, the water comes out, that's the translation. But the, those people that are my people that lived in that area were really a bridge between the coastal regions and the interior regions. And they were known as, that whole area was known as, as welcoming people and, and making sure that they're taken care of, that they had enough, that they were included in things. So I see this, this panel as, as an extension of, of our traditional beliefs of welcoming people and, and having them included and in, in doing all that stuff that, that's, that's given to us. This, this land, this water that we share, this is, we need to use it and be out and connected to it. So I'm really excited about this panel. This is really cool. All right. Well, go ahead, Kate. I think just around um, uh, the term diversifying the outdoors, I think one thing that um, for me, just kind of understanding and, and um, realizing in myself that, you know, my people, like we were on our homelands before coming here. So um, like they're in our language, there's no word for hike. There's no word for these kinds of um, Western ways, these Western recreational, like recreational activities is not like a, a thing, but being on the land is a thing and being in relationship and, and reciprocity with the land that you're on is a thing. And I think that's one thing that I've kind of in thinking about diversifying the outdoors, it's not just having brown and black faces in these action sports. It's um, recognizing the different ways of being on the land. And a big part of that is the relationship that, you know, um, these uh, people of different cultures bring and, and respect. And, um, you know, in, in my culture, it's a, a big thing that you ask permission before going into the jungle. And so in kind of like, coming into my own and kind of reclaiming that culture with these activities that I like to do and learn to do in this Western sense. 
um, it's definitely kind of taken me back a little bit because there is kind of one way of um, interacting and again recreating with the outdoors as a separate but um, for a lot of people indigenous peoples um, it's not separate at all and I think that's a big thing of like not just diversifying uh, the images that we see but the way that we um, think about a relationship with the outdoors. Thank you. I want to say that's one of the reasons why I want to see more diversity outside too is I want everyone in Wenatchee to fall in love with uh, the shrub step. I want everyone to fall in love with the forest so that they can take care of them later. Um, Wenatchee is definitely getting really really diverse and if most of Wenatchee doesn't fall in love with nature Wenatchee is not going to look the way it does 50, 100 years from now. Um, so that's kind of the, the very non or not so social part of it, but I just, I really want nature to get taken care of by the people who live here. And so we got to get those people outdoors so that they can fall in love with it the way that we all have. Um, I think part of it is also leaving no trace and living sustainably. If you fall in love with nature, those things just come naturally afterwards. Um, and for health reasons too. Um, I know a lot of uh, Mexican Hispanics tend to have high blood pressure and, and diabetes. So we got to get out there on those trails and, and get our hearts pumping. And so making them feel comfortable um, should be really good for all of us. That's a great segue to my um, one of my next questions about um, why is it important that the media and marketing show the diversity and you kind of started there um, Nathan, I know that you are the founder of uh, the Stellion Company. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience, particularly with that topic? Yeah. Um, I mean, the great outdoors is really just a place for healthy um, living. And I just, for, for so long, there's been a huge barrier between obviously diversity in the outdoors um and a lot of that goes from you know historical reasons and and whatnot but i think just having more and more people outdoors just there's a sense of of um lifted health uh things that you can't really put down on paper and having more people of color um uh, gay lesbian um queer trans, um, Latino, um, just everybody uh, coming outside to experience this, this health. Um, I think it's, it's crucial to, uh, to one, like sustaining, sustaining the outdoors, uh, but also just mental health. Um, it's, just, it's, it's, just, it's just a wonderful gift and everybody should be able to experience it from wherever they come from. And you know, one of the things that has really, you know, touched, touched me and, you know, business mission and things like that is just making sure that, you know, everybody feels included. Um, and even if that's just going to, you know, a state park, um, just getting outside is just so healthy. And it's, it's something that a lot of people take for granted. And I think it's just more important to really, really just open up that access of making people feel welcome. The end of our, um, yes, Julie. <laughs> the end of our huckleberry season is coming in. Um, I just got back from a three-day trip out to the woods, huckleberry picking. And one of the things that comes to mind for me is family. You know, when you're doing stuff outside, it's always about family. I'm spending time, getting to know each other, um, conversation. A lot of us forget to have conversation today because of our phones, computers, laptops, all those things that separate us in our own home. I sit across the couch on my, in my house across from my husband and he's on his phone. I'm on my phone, you know, but when you go outside, there's a lot of times you get signals. So you have to talk to each other mm. outside and, and going outside is, is it, it stirs your brain. It stirs your, stirs your heart because you have memories. It's, 
it's such a good thing. And I think that's why people ought to get out because they're forgetting. They're forgetting about what it's like without all of these, um, for lack of a better word, conveniences. You know, maybe the outside isn't convenient for everybody, but it's probably healthier, mentally healthier, physically healthier. Um, and it teaches you empathy, teaches you respect because you can't get complacent in the woods. You have to respect nature. Or you'll get hurt. There's a lot of things about nature that is just constant education. You know, the plants, the smells, um, how to get things done. You know, when you go camping, take somebody out there who's never put a tent up. That's a learning experience. It's something they'll take with them forever. You know, picking the right berries, um, knowing which trees are too sappy to, to get too close to, or you're gonna get your fingers sticky. You know, there's all kinds of things out there from the very little to the really huge um, recognizing bear scat and knowing which way to go to get away from it. Um, I think that, that people going out there just gives them the opportunity to open their mind and be a better person because when you leave the woods, you're a little more humble. Okay, I don't want to cut anyone off. So if you want to jump in and just talk over me, but um, I uh, we're getting some questions in about how um, locally we can help um, diversify our um, our own like recreational activities. How can we make them more inclusive? What are some ideas um, so that we can lower these barriers that that um, that are out there. One of the successes that we've had at Team Atralesa to get more Hispanic Latinx families involved is to have a community liaison. Um, and so I saw a question from Robin Dottie from Kingston. Um, I think that's what I would suggest is getting a community liaison. So if the community you're trying to reach out to uh, as black or indigenous, just get somebody from that community. Um, maybe somebody young and just full of energy, uh, somebody who's not afraid to get turned down because a lot of people will say, no, I'm not interested. Uh, somebody who just will work hard and is trusted, just has all of those leadership skills. Um, hire them, get them involved and get them to do the community work for you. I think also kind of along, along those lines, I think sometimes we, we, those of us who are fairly new to the Valley still don't know a lot about the local history. And um, as I've been learning more about the local history, it's been exciting to learn about the presence of diverse peoples in this region. Uh, the indigenous populations, of course, uh, Latinx as well, but even like, I want to say, I think it was earlier this year, I don't know, COVID brain timeline. I don't know when I found out about him, but uh, uh, Antoine Etienne, a self, uh, an emancipated, you know, formerly enslaved man who was prospecting up um, up at Blewett, and then sort of, it was also in, 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 in the Annette Valley, excuse me, a little stutter going on there. I've been excited to learn what I can about him and his journey, and I'm, I'm reaching out to uh, some folks at Fish and Wildlife to help me understand how we can maybe have like a community trail maintenance day on his creek, you know, <laughs> or uh, just to make folks aware that this has always been a, uh, a diverse crossroads of people. Um, I loved what, um, uh, uh, what John was saying about the, uh, this region and the, the uh, his, Sorry, I'm really nervous. I don't know, I didn't sleep really well. Um, but how his tribe's history of being welcoming and kind of creating the space as a crossroads of welcoming, well, I think that's a gateway for talking about many ways that many people have come here and been welcomed here and been able to have their stories become part of the story of this place. Um, 
and that'll hopefully get more folks willing to get out and explore some of those places that exist as uh, memory and as uh, tribute to the folks who've come before. So I just wanted to add, um, I think that it's important to, you know, to uplift community leaders that are already in place um, doing the work and putting in the time. You know, we don't really need someone to come in and try and diversify the valley, right? We've got people that are already here that are actively getting outside, actively, you know, creating organizations and nonprofits that are surrounding doing things like this. Um, I know we could definitely use more, um, but I think it's always important, you know, Team, team Natural Lisa, like we have you here, and I think that if maybe at the end or however we could just explain how we can support you, you know, how can we contribute or donate and uplift the work that's already being done and in place here, right? And and recognizing that how important that is, you know, to not try and come in and take place of, but to already like support and uplift the people that are doing the work and creating a space for um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Um, also, the second thing I just wanted to add was to make sure that we understand like, um, Diversity or the lack thereof in the outdoors has been created by, um, you know, society and racism and, you know, marginalized communities are shut out and have barriers because of our history, you know, in our society. And I think that, um, you know, the importance of not only diversifying the outdoors, but acknowledging the problem and why it is there um, is so important too. you know, we're, we're kind of touching on just the problem with, with racism, you know, that's really what it is, is like just a problem with people of color feeling comfortable and getting outdoors. And I think the sooner we let the elephant in the room just kind of be there and acknowledge that, then the, that's definitely a, a better thing. But um, deconstructing racism in all areas of your life, you know, not just in the outdoors, but at work, in your community, in your circle of friends, at your kitchen table when you're having dinner with your family, you know, like that all needs to be broken down. It's not the outdoors as the only issue, you know, it, racism is not just in the outdoors, it's all over, everywhere we look, we've, we've felt it, you know, as panelists. So I think it's important just to recognize that this isn't just an outdoors issue, it's, it's an issue that happens systemically all over our country. That's right. Um, one of um, the things I was thinking about is how do, do I, how do I, when I'm out in nature, or um, outside and I witness um, racist, maybe it's terminology or maybe it's just um, a presence, I guess. <laughs> what can I do? What can we as a community do to speak up against racism when we experience it in those outdoor spaces? document it. <laughs> uh, I, I think about the, uh, the gentleman who was almost uh, lynched in the Midwest this, uh, this last summer. Like, thank God someone had their phone out and they videotaped it, right? Or there I go, showing my age again. But um, I think the temptation is to, sometimes the temptation where, like, say if it's just a racist graffiti, is to, nope, I'm going to clean this up. This doesn't get to be here. This doesn't get to stay here. How dare, and I love that impulse, but document it. Document it first, because we need to know um, where folks are being physically threatened. It's, you know, I'm not saying make a martyr out of yourself, because there are clearly some folks who will be perfectly willing to martyr other folks. Um, but if you can at least speak up, speak up and document it, <laughs> you know. Um, I used to do a lot more solo hiking 
and uh, kind of going off into the woods off my own. I do a lot less of that now. Um, and, and I go instead with some of my friends. And, you know, most of my friends here are white. That's, you know, math. And uh, I joke with them. I'm like, you're my beard. <laughs> don't wander too fast and don't go too far because I know I'm bringing up the rear. Just don't leave me. Um, and, and they don't. And I appreciate that because that helps create uh, a solidarity space and a braver space for me and a safer space for me too. Um, and when I've been with them, I haven't had the racist encounters that I have had when I've been on my own. I, again, coming from a law enforcement background, for people going out in the woods, you need to be a good witness down information, important information, license plates, number of people, descriptions of the people, because if it's happened once, chances are it's happened before and it'll happen again. Documentation, like um, Karen said, is a way to build a case. So the more information that your law enforcement has, if these people, if these people that are doing this are continually doing this, then a case will build against them. Eventually, they can be banned from the area, depending on where it is, uh, NPS, BLM, um, Bureau of Land Management, um, specific areas. Um, they can notify those areas that these individuals are creating this kind of chaos with um, people of color or people of a... Uh, um, gender wise or sexually orientation, sexual orientation type things, those type of people are out there and the more information that you can set aside and give to law enforcement when they come just helps in the way to manage these incidents. And, and then it also helps getting the word out to other people that these things are happening. So maybe, maybe that's a good, weak to avoid that place or that specific area you know the best way to protect yourself against this kind of stuff is to not be in areas where it's happening um i think just to kind of you know continue on with um what karen and julie are saying as far as if, if you're a witness but also um witnessing your own internal biases and your own internal um, uh, impulses, I guess, as far as like what is right and wrong, what needs to be called into the cops or not in particular, if you're thinking about, um, you know, uh, I guess there, is this idea of the right way to be outside, the right way to camp, the right way to hike, the right way to be a bird watcher, if you're thinking about um, Mr. Cooper in New York City, um, the right way to, you know, and, and so I think as far as thinking about, um, you know, yes, being a safe space and a brave space and um, an accountable space for your, friends and community members that um, have historically been marginalized in all spaces, but as far as like thinking about what impulses you might have to police some sort of behavior outdoors, um, I think that's something that, you know, again, kind of going back to um, breaking down the idea and the, the privilege of who has a right to be outside and in what way they do that. I'm, I'm glad you brought up the bird watching incident because I was curious if you guys would share with, um, with us um, your response, I guess, to hearing about that incident. Um, have you had a similar experience here that are more local? And um, how has that like incident, uh, because it was put on a national spotlight, how has that like highlighted how white people treat people of color in outdoor spaces?
I've definitely had to be more aware of where I'm pointing my binoculars. Um, I don't want people to think that I'm spying on them, um, especially in the rural, the rural areas um, where people would typically be birding. So I think that's the one thing I kind of that the first thought that came to my mind is I got to be really careful where I point them at. I don't want people to think that I'm invading their privacy and, and stir something up. Um, but it was, yeah, it's just very unfortunate that not people of all color can safely bird. It's one of the best things out there. I think just what John shared at the beginning as far as, um, you know, new staff coming into the Forest Service and questioning why him and his people are on their homelands. You know, I think that's if you're in a position of um, power and privilege in, in these outdoor agencies, um, you know, and um, I, I think that that's where, you know, even what Karen shared about um, being aware of the history, being aware of the policies, being aware of those sorts of things, because then it, it changes the way that you interact with people. Um, you know. Um, we talked about some barriers and we talked about some work that you all are doing locally. Um, we've had some questions come in and wanted to know, um, one, is there like a uh, equipment exchange or someplace that we can get the word out resources that we can share so people um, who are who have a, an economic barrier to participating in an outdoor recreation can um, get those resources and how can we as a community support you and your organizations and what you're doing um, or other local in, um, organizations not represented on the panel that are doing to help um, make the outdoors more inclusive. I've heard of a couple of thinking of starting a co-op, uh, or, or but I, I don't know how far they've gotten yet. So that could be, I mean, I think that would be wonderful, especially since my daughter, uh, much like Chelsea's kids, my daughter's 10, so she's a little bit older than yours, Chelsea, but she is actually pushing me into the outdoors a lot more, but her gear is expensive. And so I would love to see uh, a co-op or swap or something particularly focused on our kids and as they grow like weeds and um, and also for adults but uh, I, I hope that effort really does move forward and and maybe if there are folks on this call who want to be part of that they can reach out to um, WRI and, 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 and just let you know and, and not saying that you guys are going to lead the charge but at least be the initial repository of information uh, so that whoever does lead the charge can circle back with you. For anyone in the Wenatchee area, the North Central Regional Library does uh, check out nature backpacks. Um, I think they have about 20 of them, if I'm not mistaken. Um, that's the only place I think you can check out some stuff. Um, but there are a lot of organizations like the Fish Hatchery, I know us, Team Atrolesa and WRI, I think between just those three organizations, we probably own about 300 pairs of snowshoes. Um, so, I mean, there's, we have some, like some of us have the gear, so we really just need to get organized and get it to the right people, the right families, and just figure out how to, how to coordinate them. Yeah, and just piggybacking on top of both of those things, um, I don't know um, of anything physically happening here in the Valley, but um, I have seen just like circling around Instagram, some brands and just, you know, normal people like you guys and uh, me that have started, you know, just kind of tackling their... Um, their gear and putting it together and then just putting it out there that it's for BIPOC, you know, people that 
specifically our black indigenous or people of color that want to get outdoors. Um, but man, if anybody wanted to start that business venture, I would be right behind you, like supporting. And yeah, like Karen was saying, I have just actually really utilized um, Upper Valley Mend and the thrift store here in Leavenworth because there are parents just kind of literally giving that stuff away. And like also Karen was saying, the kids just grow like weeds and you know, one summer you might need a backpack and the next season you don't. And um, yeah, I just think that that would be a really cool idea and allow people of color to be able to check, you know, gear off the list, you know, to have that accessibility to that. Um, but yeah, that's definitely a, a great thought and a great business venture I would love to see <laughs> progress for sure. Um, we are getting lots of requests for resources. So on the museum's website, we have a page for our social justice series. And after today's panel, we will um, put links to resources on there, including any um, websites for the um, panelists organizations. So um, we will compile that list um, after this forum and, and put it up on, on our website to share with our viewers and anyone who, who watches later. Um, if you are watching and you know of an organization that we don't, um, please email us at info at wvmcc.org um, and we will make sure to include, include that, those resources on our website too. You can also um, send us a, a chat or a comment right now live as well. Actually, there was a comment asking for me to share um, our, the scholarship program at Wenatchee River Institute for fall day camps. We're starting now that schools are all online. We want students to still have access to outside time and nature immersion and science education. So um, we are offering full scholarships to these programs and we're also doing a structure of pay what you can. So whatever a family is able to pay for their child to participate in the camps, they're two days a week throughout the fall. It was brought to our attention that Mission Ridge is not represented on this panel. Um, sn snowing, skiing, um, snow sports, they are included in our area, of course. Um, we neglected to mention them other than in the etc. And I'm sorry about that for my introduction. Um, but but yes, uh, we can't forget that that the winter sports do exist here as well, and that it's important that everyone has the opportunity to participate as the, in those also. Um, are there any last remarks or anything that we haven't asked? that you want to share about yourself, your organization, your experience, um, your hopes for um, our community. I just want to say thank you for, for doing this um, and for creating a platform and a forum for us all to network and get connected and for people um, in the Valley that might not hear some of these things um, to be able to like create a space for them to hear these things from so many different backgrounds and walks of life. Um, I think it's important that people in this Valley um, recognize that we are here, right? We're all here. We're all taking up space. I live in Leavenworth. I know, Karen, you, you, we all live like in this valley, you know, we're all represented here. We're all getting outdoors. So if you do see us outside or out on the trail, just make sure you say hello. And I know speaking from me, I, I love to talk. So if you have any questions or just like want to hike and get together, then I'm definitely available. Nathan, I think you were going to say something. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think it's just great to remember that we're all in this together um, and just to be kind to one another. And I, I think 
you know, there's, there's so many resources that are available in the community. Sometimes it's just about just asking um, if it's a, uh, the, the ski um, resort, um, building relationships, um, letting them know uh, what's needed. A lot of times people just don't know because it's not asked. And I, I feel like the more that um, there is a commonality of saying, hey, let's build together. Let's build this community together. Let's, um, you know, how can we help each other out? Um, how can we invest in our future? You know, how can we get these little kids in some skis? Um, there's not a lot of little black boys, little black girls, indigenous little boys, indigenous little girls jumping on skis. Um, just doing whatever you can to just really kind of extend that hand and just say, hey, we're here together. Um, tip your hat, say hi to people when you're on the trail, obviously right now with a mask. But um, yeah, and just wanted to say thanks for putting this together. I think big things happen just with small conversations like this and people taking the time to, to unite and just, and just talk. So thank you. All right, it looks like that we are coming to an end of our time here today. So thank you all for joining us for this social justice community forum series. I would like to once again um, thank the Wenatchee River Institute for your partnership on the forum, this forum in our series. If you have a topic you would like us to add to our series on social justice, please send us your suggestions through the comments and chats or you can email us at info at wvmcc.org. Info at wvmcc.org. Those are the Wenatchee Valley Museum and Cultural Center initials, so wvmcc.org. The next forum in this series, um, we will be discussing dismantling racism in education, and we will be announcing a date for that um, in October soon. Thank you again to all our panelists and audience for your partic participation today. And we hope you'll be able to join us again as we continue this conversation.